So I have a question to ask you. Do you ever listen to your walls? Yes, he said, thank you. Um, it's a serious question. When I was a little girl, um, I grew up in the house that my father built. He built it the year I was born. I have four brothers, and I'm the small one in the family. This house is really, really tiny. And because I was the only girl, I usually had my own bedroom, although I often shared it with one of the babies because the crib was in my bedroom. And so privacy was at a premium. So what I would often do if I was trying to kind of find a space of my own was go into the closet, the clothes closet in my bedroom, and I would sneak into that little place that exists behind the back of your clothes as they hang on the hangers and the wall. I don't know if, it, if you guys have ever been in that space. If you haven't, you should go there because it's probably dirty and you could, could use a dusting. But I'd go and I'd sit in there, often with a book and a flashlight. But sometimes I would just sit in the dark and listen to the walls. I would hear late at night when my brother was coming home from a date. And I could tell how late he was and how quietly he was trying to sneak in the house so he wouldn't get caught for missing curfew. I would listen to the sounds of my father coming in from being out drinking all night. And I would pay attention to whether he was mean drunk that night or happy drunk. I would listen to my mother's footsteps as she was going up and down the hallways taking care of the kids and dinner and, and ironing and doing all of the things she did to keep our family together. So I learned to listen to the walls. I didn't know then that I was learning how to listen to the world in a way that gave me access that has been very important in my career. Any more than I knew 10, 12 years later when I was a teenager and madly in love with the farm boy from up the road, and we would, after work, I worked at a fast food restaurant in the Fry Kitchen and he worked at his father's dairy farm, and he'd finish up milking in the barn and drive to this little village I grew up in, and he'd pick me up at the fast food restaurant, and we'd go to the water tower property next to my home. And we'd climb up the water tower, and we'd sit on the catwalk late at night and talk and watch the stars. And he'd talk about his dreams in life, which were to go to college and get a really good job and make money and settle down and have a family. And my dreams were taking off from the small airport about 20 miles away, and landing, lights of airplanes, and I'd look at them and say, I want to know who the people are on that plane and where they're going and what's going to happen there. And as much as we loved each other, and we truly did, we realized we weren't going to be together because our dreams were different and mine needed to follow this curiosity out into the world. Fast forward to this listening in the dark, and I'm on a story, many of you have heard this, so I'll make it brief. I'm in Africa during the sub-Saharan famine back in 1985, northern Sudan, where all the refugees were coming over the border. I had never been overseas before in my life. It was the biggest story I had ever been handed. I was scared to death. During the day, the photographer I worked with and I would go into the compound, which was basically just a huge area surrounded by a straw wall, and we would report. We'd walk around, we'd observe. We couldn't talk to many people because we didn't have the language. So mostly we had to listen with our other senses. And then at night, we'd have to leave. As soon as it got dark, we couldn't stay within the compound of the refugee camp. So we'd go to the other side of a straw wall, and we had a little straw hut, and there was a cot, and that's where we would sleep. Mostly we laid awake. We were hungry, we were scared, we were not sure we were up to the task of this story. And as we would lay awake, both within our own sort of space of fear, I would listen, and I would listen to the sounds of people dying. That last rattle of breath that people have before they take their last breath. I would listen to people getting up and going outside their little plastic twig huts that they were living in, their little shelters, and trying to walk as far as the defecation zone at the edge of the camp, which was their only bathroom. I'd listen to babies crying. I'd listen to the end of babies crying when they couldn't cry any longer. Most of the people who died there every night, about 75 or 100 of them, were babies. And through all of this, I also kept hearing singing. <laughs> 
And when I first heard it, I thought I was kind of hallucinating. I thought I was in the middle of one of those halfway asleep dreams. But every night I'd hear this singing. Really rhythmic, lovely, deep voices, just voices, no percussion. Occasionally I'd hear a little bit of pounding on a pot. And so finally I asked somebody what the singing was about. And what I learned was that at night, the elders in a family, what was left of a family of refugees who had come there, or in a community that had left its village in Eritrea or Oromo and ended up in a refugee camp in Sudan, and whoever was left would gather together and live in these huts and shelters together. At night, the elders, the adults, sat around and sang to the children. They sang them their history, they sang them their morals, they sang them their values, they sang them their hopes. So what I realized was that as people were leaving their villages because they had nothing left, and all they could bring was what they carried, a blanket, a pot, maybe a small bag of seeds, they all brought their stories. They all brought their stories. And they shared those stories by passing them along orally. All of these events happened in the dark when I had no ability to do anything but listen. They say that our senses are more acute when one's taken away. So people who live without sight tend to have a more acute sense of sound. You all know the story of Helen Keller, I'm sure. She had an incredible sense of touch. She would touch things and that's how she read the world because she couldn't see it. I'm fascinated by this notion because so much of what we do in our lives as journalists and just as people who live in the 21st century is loud. We listen to things constantly, we're plugged into things constantly, we're in people's faces, we're constantly tweeting or messaging or back and forthing an email. So there's all this noise. But what happens if you take the noise away once in a while and learn once again to listen, to truly listen? Listening in the dark also forces you to think about these other senses. Several years ago, I was covering a story that allowed me to go to Antarctica three times. It was a dog sled expedition. It was great fun, great adventure. And when we first landed in Antarctica, the main character in my story, who was an Arctic explorer, mountain climber, adventurer from Minnesota, where I was working at the time, he was a real character, a real oddball. And I was trying to get a sense of who he was beyond your usual Q&A that you do as a journalist. And the first night we were there, um, Antarctica at the time, it was the time of year where there were only about two or three hours of light during the day. Most of the time it was dark. So you're up a lot when it's dark, and I was out walking, trying to kind of get my bearings, and Will, Will Steger, the main character, was out too. And he says, have you looked up? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, have you looked up? And I looked up, and there was the southern hemisphere of stars. Which, if you've never been in the southern hemisphere and looked up, you can't imagine how disorienting it is to not see the stars in the sky that you're used to. First, to not have to look through any light pollution, to see stars as they truly are with no other lights around. They're overwhelming. And so I looked up, and I got a little dizzy. And Will says, let's go lay down and look at the stars. So he took my hand and we walked out into the middle of a blue ice runway, which is where the planes land in this part of the world. It's, it's ice that's so hard it turns blue and then it gets a snowpack on it, which is their only traction. You don't want to ever fly into Antarctica, trust me. And we laid on our back side by side and we looked at the stars. And Will told me stories about, about the constellations in the southern hemisphere. And I learned more about this man who had this sense of wonder that went back to childhood than I would have if I had not laid on my back in the ice and snow and had him tell me stories about the stars. I had to go to the place he was and let, me, let him guide me to see the world the way he sees it in order for me to get closer to who he was and to write about him better. So senses are an important, a very important part of the way we report. And often we get, we get stuck on just sound, what we ask people and what we get in, re in reply, 
Although recent studies show that something like 20% of how we communicate as human beings comes through the words we speak. 20%. The rest is body language, it's tone of voice, it's how we move. It's the nuance, of, it's the things we don't say when we speak. The stuff that exists between the lines, that exists in the silences, that exists in that moment when you're talking to someone and all of a sudden they stop and they switch gears because there's some place they didn't want to go. That's the other way that we communicate. As a result, when we do this work, whatever kind of storytelling we're doing, whether it's for a professional purpose in our job, whether we're an employer and we're trying to listen to an employee because we've got to help them solve a problem, whether it's in our personal life and we need to listen to our parents as they're getting older and we have to help them figure out what wishes they want honored when they can no longer make decisions for themselves, we have to pay attention to our senses. Not just the sense of sound, but the sense of sight, what do we see? Can we look at those stars? The sense of touch, which is an interesting one. We don't think much about touch as storytellers, especially professional storytellers, especially in the United States where you can get sued way too easily for inappropriate touching. One of the things that I did when I was in Antarctica trying to do stories was figure out how to write about, how to translate cold to people who lived in northern Minnesota where it's already really cold. So how do you get people who know cold to understand true cold? So I'd think about it a lot and what I finally decided was I couldn't come up, I, I, I spent hours trying to figure out how do I describe 70 shades of white? Because everything in Antarctica is white and if you look closely you see pink and blue and green and yellow and gray and beige and you see color upon color upon color. That took me only so far. I couldn't help people see the stars that I was seeing. So instead I realized that every day when I would get up and take a walk, and this was my second trip there, so now we have 24 hour sunlight. Sun never gets below one o'clock in the sky. It's really, really disorienting to never have dark. So in the middle of the night, where it's still daylight and I'm restless, I would go out for a walk to try to get warm. I was stuck there, I was stranded there for three weeks, I was supposed to be there overnight, I'm stranded there three weeks, big epic tale, I don't need to give you the details except to know that I was there for 17 days and I was the only woman among a crowd of 17 men and I didn't have any clean clothes with me. That is not, that is not a recipe for good romance. Um, so I go for these walks and I got in the habit for some reason of counting the number of steps it would take me before I could start to feel my feet. And then I would count the number of steps it would take me to get from the point where my feet had that burning sensation they get when, your feet, when you're really cold and it's starting to thaw, to the point where they actually felt really good. And then I started thinking, well, what if I paid attention to the feel of 60 below wind coming at my face? What does my skin feel like? Is it like little pinpricks? Is it like fire, icy fire? So I was paying attention to the sense of touch. Years later, I was working with a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who was doing an absolutely stunning piece on a woman who had to decide whether to give her severely disabled child. He had spiked a fever when he was 11 days old and got spinal meningitis and was rendered near vegetative. She spent two years taking care of him at the exclusion of everything else in her life and she finally had to make a decision about saving her marriage and her other child and herself but it would mean giving this disabled child over to a long-term care facility basically a nursing home for babies and Tom Holman Jr. did this story from the Oregonian and as he was writing it and I was his editor and I was getting drafts there was something missing I kept, I kept needing to get a little closer to the story and Tom is an excellent, excellent reporter and writer. But he'd write these passages about how the baby was physically. And I'd say, well, what does it feel like? And he'd say, well, the doctors say, and then he would describe muscle tone. I'd say, well, what does the baby feel like? Well, his mother says that when she touches him, well, what does the baby feel like? And finally, I looked at Tom and I said, have you held the baby? 
Have you held the baby? And he said, well, no, um, I, I, I didn't want to presume. And I said, go pick up the baby. And he came back the next day and the story was there because he had let himself feel what that mother felt. He had let himself use the sense of touch, which is very powerful. Taste, we don't do that much unless some of you are lucky enough to be restaurant reporters. Um, I just like hanging out with the restaurant reporters because they always need somebody to go to the restaurants with them and then I don't have to worry about justifying the expense. Taste is an interesting subject though and it doesn't come off out very often, but have you ever gone to a different place and realized that not only does the air smell different, but it tastes different? If you're near an ocean, you can taste the air. Um, when I was in Africa doing my reporting, one of the things I did was I asked if I could taste the porridge that people were given. It was their only food. And it was this odd combination of some sort of, some sort of ricey porridge and oil and sugar. And it was all their bodies could absorb at that point. And I wanted to know what these people were eating. So I ate the porridge. I tasted survival. And then there's smell. And again, we don't use smell much, but keep this in mind. Studies show that smell is the human sense that is most closely attached to memory and the emotion of memory. I've never had it fail if I'm interviewing a mother about a child, even a child who's now grown, maybe a child who has died in war or in some other horrible circumstance, and I've asked that woman, what did your baby smell like? I've never had her not go back there and be in the moment of being a mother of a newborn and connecting through smell. In the same way I asked you if you listened to your walls, I would ask you if you remember the smell of your mother's kitchen as a child or your grandmother's kitchen. One of my grandmother's kitchen always smelled like gingerbread cookies. My Polish grandmother's kitchen always smelled like boiled cabbage. You can imagine where I hung out. I still remember if people ask me this, if I, if I think about the smell of the Catholic church I grew up in on midnight, um, at, at Christmas Eve for midnight mass. I remember the smell of incense and pine trees and melted wax. And then I see the church because I'm back there in my mind. So don't dismiss these senses that we bring to our ability to listen to the rest of the world. A good friend of mine refers to interviewing as a full body sport. A full body sport. And if you interview well, listen well, you come away from situations fairly exhausted because it is a total immersion event. And again, it's one that we often don't challenge ourselves to give ourselves to fully enough. So there are those normal five senses. And then I want to talk about the most important one, which is the sixth sense, emotion. Emotional intelligence that part of ourself that is uniquely human and that we often, especially as journalists, are sort of schooled and taught to turn off, to separate ourselves, to distance ourselves. In the United States, it's often spoken of under the rubric of objectivity. I could give a whole talk about how I feel about that word. The sixth sense is the thing that allows us to ask the question that our readers or viewers will most have. The question that we all would have as normal human beings who wonder how other people get through their lives. The sixth sense is what allows us to channel what would be normally a sense of revulsion if we're interviewing somebody who, um, a rapist, somebody accused of murder, um, a CEO of a company who's just ripped off his workers for his own gain. If we feel that sense of revulsion, instead of stopping there, what can we do to channel that natural human emotion 
into a better question. Into the question that asks the CEO how he sleeps with himself at night or what he tells his grandchildren about what grand, granddad does for a living. The rapist, what he would say if the woman he raped were sitting in front of him in the moment and said, why? It's the, quest, it's, it's, the, it's the sense that allows you to ask the feared question. When I was doing AIDS in the Heartland, which is our Pulitzer series from St. Paul, one of the things, and it was a story for those of you who don't know, of we followed two gay men, farmers, a, farm, a couple, from diagnosis to death with AIDS. And one of the things that I was especially fascinated by as I was following these two very, very generous men who literally gave up the last 16 months of their life to let us document everything that happened to them, was what they did in the interior of their relationship, of their love affair, to deal with the fact that one of them had brought the virus into the relationship and now they were both dying. How do you hold on to that truth in the inside of a relationship and choose instead of anger, choose love and commitment and going forward? Not an easy question to ask. Which one of you brought the virus into the relationship? Who's responsible for killing who? And where do you put that? That sixth sense emotion is what allowed me when I was interviewing a man who had lost his wife and seven-year-old daughter in a bizarre pipeline explosion, a natural gas pipeline had burst and burst into flames, exploded and burst into flames outside their house in the middle of the night, and the father got up and grabbed one daughter and went out one door, the back door, and the mother grabbed the other daughter and went out the front door, and the mother and the younger daughter ran into a fireball and were killed. And the father rode to the airport, rode to the hospital in the ambulance with the little girl, and then he sat with his wife in the last hours before she died. And the question that I felt everybody would have was, what do you say to your wife in the last hour of her life when you both know she's dying? What do you say? It's a natural question. And the thing I've learned about these kinds of questions is not to presume that people don't want to talk about it. Not to presume that you're protecting people by projecting your own discomfort. Not to presume that there are things that are too personal or too private to ask about. When I asked Don Spano about those last conversations with his wife, he responded in a very interesting way, and I need to tell you that this was a man who did not want to be interviewed. He, 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 was, he, he was mistrustful of the press. When this event happened, it was a very public event, a lot of lawsuits, because there was neglect involved um, by the pipeline company. He, um, so for eight days, nobody could get an interview with him, and of course the TV cameras were all trying to assault him, and I just kept trying to work around the edges until I finally gained an interview with him. He was still very reluctant and very guarded. And when I got to this moment, he looked at me and he said, well, we talked about her wishes for the children, that she would want them raised and continue to go to church. She wanted them raised within the faith. We talked about her desire for me to marry again so our remaining daughter would have a mother someday. And then he looked at me and he smiled, this impish little grin. And this is a man who had just lost his wife and daughter and there was nothing in his life that was happy right now. And he looked at me and he grinned and he said, and there are some things that we talked about that are none of your business. It was his way of letting me know that they had shared a moment of intimacy and he didn't have to give me the details. The key here is don't presume not to ask. Don't be afraid of the question that you think will be uncomfortable for the other person. If you ask questions like this with context, with genuine openness, without judgment, without presuming the answer, and if people know why you're asking those questions, they often will answer, and they often will answer in ways 
that amaze you. I think the key is to remember that the privacy belongs to the person who has the right not to answer your question. But if you presume not to ask the question, you're making a decision for someone else, which I think is pretty disrespectful. I can ask a question in a very respectful way and explain it, and if the person says, I don't want to talk about that, that's fine. But if I never asked in the first place, if I decided they wouldn't want to talk about it, aren't I deciding something for another human being? And if that person is old enough and um, has their faculties enough to make their own decision, why would I make it for them? My oldest brother was killed in a car accident several years ago. Um, father of three children who were just starting college. He and his wife were just starting their life together as empty nesters. They were very excited about it. He was killed by a 16-year-old inattentive driver. Um, it was very traumatic for our family. And I ended up being in the position to sort of take care of the funeral arrangements and the obituaries and all that kind of stuff. And I especially became the one in the family to deal with um, the police, because there was a police investigation. And I know how to work that system. My brothers are engineers. They, they didn't do that kind of icky stuff that journalists do. And I remember my fury when I got the newspaper that ran my brother's obituary. Because they not only got some basic facts wrong, they didn't capture anything about his character. And part of the reason they didn't is because they never called us. They never called us. I work with young reporters all the time now who get assigned obituaries as um, regular fare in journalism in America, and they always feel awkward calling the grieving relatives of somebody who's just died. And I say, well, just call and express your condolences and ask if they want to talk about their loved one. If they don't, they'll tell you. And you might feel a little awkward for a minute, but nothing bad's going to happen. Most people want to talk about their loved ones. They want a chance to, to be heard and to help you get it right. So don't make that decision for people. Um, several years ago, wait, I have to pull this up. Indulge me for two seconds while I figure out my game here. Um, several years ago, I was, not several years, two years ago now, Boston Marathon bombings a year ago, two years ago, two years ago. I was working at the Missouri School of Journalism and the bombings had happened that day and I was leaving, I was rushing to a class late in the day and this student reporter from the newspaper we put out was rushing behind me in the hallway calling my name and I didn't know this kid very well at all, he had never been in one of my classes and he, um, he said, can, can, I, can I talk to you, can I talk to you and he was, he was really agitated and I turned around and I said, well, I have to get to class, but sure, what can I do? And he says, well, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm on the team that has to call. And he was mumbling and st stuttering. And he was shaking. He was visibly shaking. And I said, what is it? Just, I said, calm down, take a breath. What is it? And he said, I'm on the team that has to call people on the list from our area who had relatives who were registered to run in the marathon and find out if they've gotten any news. And I said, okay. And he said, so I'm calling people to find out if somebody they love is dead or hurt? And I said, okay. And he said, well, you do this all the time. You've done a lot of this. And I said, okay, how can I help? And he looked at me and with anguish, anguish in his voice, he said, how do you do this work? How do you do this work? And I looked at him and I said, oh, sweetheart. Take a deep breath, make the phone call, be as respectful as you can, and recognize that you're not going to make anything any worse because if their loved one is already dead and hurt, that's already happened. That's already happened. So I told him to stay professional and stay calm and be as direct 
and compassionate as they could, and if they didn't want to talk, to move on. That's what I said out loud. Inside, I was shaking just as much, but after years of doing this, you learn to keep your shaking on the inside. Save it for private moments. And what I really wanted to say to him was, I wish I didn't have to do this work. I wish no one did. I wish it wasn't necessary to embed journalists into war zones. I wish it wasn't necessary to send reporters into areas where people are dying by the thousands of Ebola because we can't seem to get enough aid there because for some reason we just can't get past the bureaucracy. I wish it wasn't necessary to send reporters into the inner cities of the United States where gun violence is robbing us of a generation of hope. I wish none of that were necessary. But it is. It's necessary to see that, to bear witness to it, to listen to what happens to people in those situations. That's why and how we do this work. There's a reporter, now retired, named Chuck Haga. You wouldn't necessarily have any reason to um, know who he is. He worked for a small paper in North Dakota most of his career, and then ended up with the Minneapolis paper, which is a large metro. And then he went back to his paper in North Dakota because he wanted to write for people where he was from. Those are the people he cared about. They are his peeps. He's this big, burly, bear-like Scandinavian guy. Um, he's probably 6'3", probably weighs 250, 260. He's like, he looks like a human hairball. He's just like hairy everywhere. Um, and he's got those ruddy, ruddy cheeks that Scandinavians get. Very pale skin that's always kind of red because he lives in North Dakota and it's windy there. So he's this big bear of a guy and he's the gentlest soul I know. After the shootings at the massacre at the grade school in Newton, Connecticut, two, three years ago, when much of the coverage centered not just on what happened there, but on how the press was responding and how the press was showing up and in these people's faces and asking all these questions and doing that thing that you see on TV and the movies where we all, all look like vultures and jackals. Chuck wrote a column, and I want to share part of it with you because he, re he was writing about why we do this work. And he talked about all of the times that he's done work like this that's made him very uncomfortable, but he has learned that not doing it is robbing people of the gift of being heard. And part of his column says this. He was talking about a situation he was involved in when he went to an Indian reservation in the United States because there had been a shooting there and he was talking, trying to talk to people. Indian reservations are very difficult for traditional journalists to crack in the United States because they're, they're a very private culture and a very mistrustful culture with good reason. So he and a photographer parachute into this Indian reservation and they're asking all these very private questions. And he said, we and most of the other reporters were provided, were guided by a professional ethical standard. Get it right. Get it first if you can, but get it right. But in the increasingly crowded and competitive news business, we crossed some lines and made some early mistakes in trying to be first. That included pressing vulnerable people for information, for what they knew, what they saw or heard or experienced, and what they were going to do about it. And then he says this, I apologized to Red Lakers, Red Lake was the Indian reservation, many times for parachuting into their lives and asking difficult questions. I apologize again. I apologize again to the gunshot Wisconsin man whose door I was told to knock on the night he was released from the hospital, the night before his slain daughter's funeral. But one thing I have learned over these 40 plus years in the business is that many people who find themselves unwillingly at the center of terrible events want to speak about it and about what they have seen and lost. 
They want to speak about it. Give them a chance. So that's the gift of listening. But then the question is, how do we do it? How do we take that ethic or that belief and turn it into craft? This isn't a session on craft, so I'm just going to share real briefly a few of my best tips. And then I'm going to have you watch a very short video by an Indian, East, uh, India, a journalist from India, TV journalist from India, who knows more about listening and talks about it more eloquently in three minutes than I ever could. But some of the things to think about if you're listening, again, use all your senses. Use props and artifacts. Look around at the things in people's lives, the people you're writing about or want to know about or want to get to understand and ask them about that. Ask people to show you photos. It's an amazing thing that happens when you ask to see a picture. People will tell you a story about what is going on in the picture. I had a brief little encounter with Lisa Pollack last night at the bar as we were getting a drink to go up to our rooms and work. And I asked her, because I knew she had a baby last year, which is why she didn't join us last year, I said, so how's your child? And she said, oh, he's great. And I said, really, can I see a picture? And of course, she brightens up, right? You know, it's like astonishing. It's like, you know, the floodlights go on whenever you ask a mother, can I see a picture of your kid? She's like, sure. She pulls out her phone. Of course, she shows me a video. Because you don't just see pictures anymore. So we were watching this little video, and then she told me a few stories. And I learned things about Lisa that I would have never known had I not asked that question. Show me a picture. So ask people about the pictures and things in their life. Use storyteller questions. Storyteller questions are questions that help put people back in the movie of their own life. We live our lives in scenes, right? Let's go back to Shakespeare. All the life is a stage and all of us on it, actors, however that goes. Well, if you think about your own life, you think about the, the moments that things happen that matter to you. The night you were proposed to, the night your first child was born, the night of your first big story, the night you graduated, the night you got a job, whatever it is, the big fight you had with your parents or your husband or whatever. Those are the moments. That's the movie of our lives. And if you ask people questions that help them go back there, they are better able to tell you a story. So you move away from platitudinous, abstract questions like, how did it feel when you heard your son had been killed in the war, to tell me the last day you spent with your son. What did you do? What were the last words you spoke to him? What are the three things you want me to remember most about him? They're storyteller questions. Our job is to help other people tell their story. Probe. Don't be afraid to probe. That doesn't mean you have to be pushy. Sometimes it's appropriate. But it means that for every question you ask, there are layers upon layers upon layers behind that question that you can help people getting to by asking additional questions, which means slow down. We rush. We rush into a situation, we start asking questions because we're fearful that we're imposing on people's time, we're nervous about our own insecurities, we're afraid of looking stupid, and so we rush. Instead of stopping and explaining ourselves, telling people what we're doing and why we want to do it and how we're going to do it and giving them time to figure out what they might want to say. And if they ask, if you ask one question and you get an answer back, often that person is still processing what it is they want to tell you about it. My best example out of this, out of my own life, young, young journalists interview, interview me for profiles all the time as part of you know, their education. And inevitably, I'm asked, what was it like to win the Pulitzer? And inevitably, I say, great. <laughs> That's not a story. That tells you nothing. But if I'm asked, where were you when you heard? I remember the restaurant I walked into. I remember what I was wearing. I remember my editor sitting in a corner. I remember the huge, huge ice bucket with the bottle of champagne in it. I remember the first person I called. I remember I had to walk over a snowbank in April to get to this restaurant. And I was wearing high heels, and that's really stupid. Those are storyteller questions. <laughs> 
Finally, you have to believe in the purpose of what you're doing. You have to believe that this work matters, which means you have to think about what it is you're trying to achieve, whether it's telling a story, if you're a lawyer, getting evidence to shore up a trial, if you're in the healthcare industry, finding out someone's history so you know how to treat them properly, finding out what kind of support system they have. You have to understand what you're trying to achieve and how you're, how you're gonna do it because unless you believe in the work, you won't fully immerse yourself. You won't fully be present for people. And the last craft trick is strictly that. Be present. Be fully present. Or as Alex Tizan, our dear colleague who was here the first two years of this conference, would say, when you ask him what the key to good interviewing is, he says, show up and shut up. And showing up is what matters most. Show up and shut up. Be there and be there for the other person, not for you. And the more you're there for the other person, the less you're worried about your own insecurity and anxiety and shyness and nervousness about looking stupid. Because none of that matters because you're paying such close attention to the other person. I want to introduce you to briefly to E.S. Isaac, Indian journalist, who has some wisdom to offer, and then I'll close up. You know, I, uh, I must tell you that uh, I haven't gone to school for, say, about eighth standard of the school, which amounts to about uh, the 14 years old. So I was taught at home by my mom and dad, both unschooled and illiterate. One thing, first, the first thing which uh, my dad taught me was how to keep quiet, how to observe, how to absorb, how to think, how to reflect. And then he moved on to how to listen. And then when he came to how to listen, over a period of time, he taught me different types of listenings. You see, when you listen, you enjoy to listen. And then you listen to respond to something. You listen to analyze, and then you listen to identify. When we would walk in the forest, he would ask me, close your eyes and listen to the sound and identify which bird it is and how far it is located <laughs> on the trees, you know, something like that. And then later on I found that listening has, you know, a lot of strength in it. Like he told me, if you can listen simply, you can speak simply. Because he said the speaking is the other side of listening. If you can listen with clarity, you can speak with clarity. If you can listen with the tenor, tone and sound, you can speak with the tenor, tone and sound. The language that I'm talking to you, that's English, I was never taught in my school or college. The entire English language, I learned it from radio by simply listening. And the radio was BBC World Service. Now you see, uh, I, I must also tell you, our daughter, who is now a journalist, when she was young, three years old, one day I asked her, you know, what do you like more, radio or TV? She said, radio. I asked why? She said, in radio, I can see things clearly. That means listening can stimulate, activate your imagination to infinity. Whereas if you watch a TV, the, the, your imagination would get limited to what is on the screen. Therefore, I feel the listening is the foundation of entire communication skill. Every time I listen to that, I learn something new. Um, I want to uh, close by returning to the concept of walls. I asked at the beginning if you ever listen to your walls. We have a lot of them around in the world today. 
I grew up um, in Cold War era. So I grew up with the metaphor and reality of the Berlin Wall looming huge in my life. It stood for the fear we all had of the other, of the communists coming and doing terrible things to us. Um, of course, you look back now, and we were taught to duck, cover, and roll under our school desk in case the communists showed up or the nuclear bomb went off, and I'm like, I don't think that would have done me much good. But, um, so the Berlin Wall was this huge metaphor. Um, I've hiked three times in the Great Wall of China, which is an amazing place designed as much to keep people in as to keep people out. It was all about the other, about us versus them. The United States has this mania with trying to build a wall on its southern border as a preventative against illegal immigration, as if that's going to keep people from taking the most dangerous journey they possibly could to try to find something better, and many of them children dying along the way. So we think we'll build a wall, and that will somehow make a difference, because there's them and there's us, and we have to protect us. And then there are all the other walls that are rising up in our world right now. Walls of color, race, remains and maybe is even more of an issue in the United States than it used to be. Walls of religion are growing in the US. The debate between people um, on the conservative Christian right who believe that's how government should be run and people on the other side who say, no, 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 there's a wall separating church and state for a reason. Walls of geography. If I live in one place versus another, there's a big uh, news story recently about um, an abortion debate in the state of Texas and if the anti-abortion forces get their way, women will have geographic walls between themselves and health care because the, the closest abortion providers will be hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Walls of political ideology, never been stronger in my lifetime than that now exist between the severe, severe conservative right and the struggling liberal kind of confused left. There are walls of class that are really fascinating right now as the U.S. faces the worst income inequality gap since the post-war um, industrial re in, in, rise of the industry in post-World War II. There was a recent study that came out that said that people who are born and raised in one financial class can hear and listen to and trust people in their own financial race or financial class more than they can people who grew up with less or more money. And it's really hard for people to cross into those other classes and hear that other person's experience. So we add to the very distrust we're trying to heal. And if we can't hear the experience of people whose lives are different than ours, how do we, how do we pass policies or make decisions that help all of us as a society? That's another wall. There's the wall that is the echo chamber we live in because of digital media, where we're constantly plugged into what we already believe and we're not hearing anything else. And then there's the wall of our own reticence and fears. All those things that we specifically, individually, uniquely are afraid of. That's natural human nature. I only know one way to knock down those walls, and that's to listen through them to hear what's on the other side, and to recognize that what's on the other side of all those walls is not them, it's another part of us. And unless we're willing to hear that story, we're not gonna recognize that other part of us, and we're not gonna be able to go forward in any way that is other than more and more separated. There's a tradition among Native American tribes in the US, I think it comes from the Lakota Sioux, and it's the tradition of a talking stick. And the way it worked was that at um, councils, meetings, back 200 years ago, the tribal leaders would all get together, and sometimes people from the tribe themselves, it depended on the issue, and they would have a meeting, and there was a magic talking stick, a spiritual talking stick, and it was a spiritual thing. And whoever had the stick had the floor. And by holding the stick, 
you were holding on to the promise that you were going to speak honestly and authentically and with purpose and with compassion for the other people in the room. And the flip side was that the people who didn't have the stick were charged to truly listen. So not to be thinking about what they want to say and what they're going to argue, but when you didn't have the stick, your job was solely to listen to the person who was talking. It's a fascinating concept and a very, very powerful one. Many of you who've heard me before at these conferences know that I believe very much in the power of storytelling. And I have spoken many times about the notion of storytelling and stories being the ultimate kind of human um, center, the thing that we do that other animals don't. As I was getting ready to speak to you today and as I'm working on this project with my students, I've been working on it for three or four years now on interviewing and on listening, I've come to think that we have to get even more basic and more profound. And that is instead of thinking just about storytelling, we need to think about listening as the true human power. And as a truly intimate human connection, maybe the most intimate human connection, is listening to another person. So one thing I want to leave you with is this notion of our roles as storytellers being not just the scribe of a tribe, but being the tribe's listener. If listening is that fire, that glow, that light that holds us together and gives us a sense of possibility, then maybe one of our jobs as journalists and other storytellers is to protect and preserve and nurture and carry the embers of that flame and to do it by listening. Thank you.